Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to present today Deep Kernel Learning for Mortality Prediction in the Face of the Temporal Shift. I'm Miguel Rios and this work was done in collaboration with Amina Buhana. We are from the Department of Medical Informatics at the Amsterdam UMC. This is the contents for today's talk, the background on the problem of temporal shift, deep kernel learning, the tool that we are going to use, the experiments for temporal shift and internal validation, and finally, the conclusions and future work. So mortality prediction models provide probabilities of dying in the ICU. And prediction models are trained with large collections of electronic health records. That includes, for example, demographics and physiological variables. And time series are very common with this kind of data, given that we have fine-tuned, fine-grained, sorry, uh, measurements from instruments across time. So neural networks provide a robust representation for time series and sometimes outperform the standard regression models. As we can see here, recurrent neural networks have become prevalent to model time series data, resulting in non-linear classification models. However, this type of prediction models are developed with historical electronic health record data. And there are changes over time. So patient characteristics, technology, guidelines, etc. So that this temporal shift can hold calibration and discrimination. So for example, we can see here that models are usually trained and evaluated in distribution. As time passes, prospective patients can end up being out of distribution and we can have a drop in discrimination and calibration. So how we can tackle the temporal shift? One way is to incorporate our certainty into a probabilistic model to improve predictions but we want to keep the representation power of neural networks. So we choose deep kernel learning, the framework of deep kernel learning that combines neural networks and Gaussian processes. And we test this deep kernel learning, the robustness of the deep kernel learning to a temporal shift. So here we can see that the deep kernel learning, apart from making a prediction, is going to give you a measure of confidence, the standard deviation. So what is this deep kernel learning? So the deep kernel learning leverage fusion extraction from neural networks. For example, in our case, we are going to use RNNs that are very good at the notion of order or compressing time, previous time steps and the uncertainty from the Gaussian process. Here in this case, the Gaussian process that we are looking at is the output and the dots are the observations. The red line is the prediction and we can see this pink band as our confidence estimate of the, of the prediction. Mm -hmm. So here for a new instance, we can see the pipeline that the neural network is going to produce futures or representations for the GP to make predictions and uncertainty. So what is the Gaussian process? Let's, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. So the Gaussian process assigns a distribution of our functions that describe our input data. And like we see before, we saw before, the neural network is going to produce these X inputs, futures or representations for us to learn our function that we are interested in that is going to be sampled from a Gaussian process with a zero mean and more importantly, a kernel function then this kernel function, what it gave us is to model the covariance between all possible input pairs and provides a measure of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Another thing with the Gaussian process is that it can change model capacity given the observed data. So where we have more observed points, we are going to have a lower uncertainty. When is the case that when we have less observed points or we are far from the observed points, we are going to have a higher uncertainty. So this is our hypothesis, is that when uncertain, the Gaussian process is going to provide predictions closer to the global mean rather than overconfident predictions. And we are going to have at the end a model that is good, that has good representations and is robust to out of distribution. 
like we saw before, when we are in distribution, the model is going to have a low variance, a low uncertainty. And when it's out of distribution, the model is going to have less extreme predictions. It's going to have a higher uncertainty. So let's have a look at our high architecture and hyperparameters that we use for the deep kernel learning. So the deep kernel learning, first you need an architecture, a neural network architecture that is going to give you futures or representations for the GP. First of all, for each input, we are going to project into a linear layer, then encoded with a bidirectional RNN for time series. Later, the output of the, the hidden states of the bi RNN, we are going to combine them with a linear layer with a non-linearity rel. And we're going to summarize all these futures with an average. Mm -hmm. We use these hyperparameters, uh, Adam Whitler in grade, one minus three, 30 epochs, linear layer size of 16. We use BioLSTM for the BioRNN, and the BioLSTM has a hidden size of 16, batch size of 100, drop out of 0 0.3, apply after each linear layer, for the kernel, for the uh, kernel in the GP, we are going to use an RBF, a common kernel for Gaussian processes, and we are going to perform model selection with the development data set based on AUC rock. So for our experiments, we are going to use the medical information marked for intensive care, the MIMIC tree, that is an open source data with a structure and unstructured uh, ICU information. We are going to use as an input, 17 input physiological variables over time. That is a subset of uh, physionet challenge. And we are going to perform normalization and uh, imputation given the previous hour. Our task is going to predict in hospital mortality after the first 48 hours of an ICU stay. How we are going to perform our evaluation, our performance metrics. We are going to split that into training, validation, and test sets. We are going to use AUC ROC and AUC PR with a mean and a standard deviation of 10 runs to check whether the improvements come from our model or any random initialization of neural networks. ROC and calibration cores, prior score, the lower is better. But in addition to this, we are going to check whether the Gaussian process predictions are actually less extreme in the out of OOD case, in the out of distribution when we are changing time. Mm -hmm. So we are going to use some sharpness that is a tendency to be away from zero or one of the predictions and close to the mean. So we are going to compare these two models. We are going to use a bio LSTM baseline here on the left. As you can see, the architecture is quite similar. The difference is that in this case, we are going to have a linear output prediction instead of a GP. And as you can see, you now we are just going to have a prediction. This is going to be a point estimate. We are not going to have for the baseline uh, an uncertainty output out of it. So let's have a look at our experiments for the temporal shift. In MIMIC, there is a change in recording system. First, it was CareView from 2001 to 2008, and then MetaVision from 2008 to 2000. And 12, and we are going to use CareView split for training and validation, and MetaVision split for test. As a second experiment, we are going to conduct an internal validation with all the sources all the time. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we are asking us this question: is is it time actually the source of this of these discrepancies? Mm -hmm. Here we see in the left the temporal shift case. The out of distribution is going to be 2008 to 2012, and it's going to be trained from 2001 to 2008. Mm -hmm. And for the internal validation, all the sources are going to be included. So it's in distribution. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at the results. We compare the baseline and the deep kernel learning. This part is related to the internal validation in the development data set, curve view. This part is related with the out of distribution, metavision, temporal shift. 
as you can see, when the models are in distribution, they have quite similar results. But when we move out of this distribution, when we move to, to prospective patients, you can see a drop, a drop for, for both models. But the deep kernel learning is, is a bit better in this case. Okay. So we can see it here with the drop core, a calibration plot. Another interesting thing that we can observe that the deep kernel learning has a bit better calibration than the BioLSTM. And we can con confirm no, that these predictions are less sharp with our own sharpness. So the deep kernel learning on sharpness, the, the, the higher the better. So 0 0.061 for the deep kernel learning. For the BioLSTM, 0 0.025. And the Breyer score is also better, lower for the deep kernel learning than the BioLSTM. Mm -hmm. Now let's have a look at the internal validation results. And as you can see, both models are quite similar, are quite close. And even in the test set, the BioLSTM is a bit better. That's good. So when, when we are in the, in the same distribution, you can kind of trust your, your deterministic models. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, let's have a look at the uh, rock curve and the calibration plot. Both of them are quite similar. The um sharpness is still a bit better for the deep kernel learning. And the Breyer score is still a bit better, a bit lower for the deep kernel learning, but they are quite close. Mm -hmm. So what are our conclusions and future work? The deep kernel, sorry, the deep kernel learning is robust to a population shift and is better calibrated in the case of auto distribution. In the same distribution, both models show similar results. The, G, the GP component of the deep kernel learning does not degrade the overall performance and it provides, provides uncertainty estimates. So that's, that's quite interesting. Now we changed our neural network, but we didn't break it. So that's good. And for future work, we will analyze different types of uh, kernels in the GP. We are going to evaluate our uncertainty estimates and check out possible discrepancies over time because so far we just did it like uh, coarse grain, like curve view and metavision. But what happens when we go into the population? So yeah, thank you. <laughs>